everyone. Welcome to Mind Speak on Hill Global. I am Samik Sen. Joining us today, a Padma Bhushan, a computer scientist. He is also known as the father of supercomputing in India, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar. First of all, thank you so much for taking out this time. It is lovely to have you with us for the interview. Hey, and welcome to Hell Global. I would like to begin by asking you, please tell us about the journey of supercomputer of India. Well, uh, the journey began. The journey began when we were denied the supercomputer that we wanted for weather forecasting. India is a agriculture country. Our economy at that time, up to even today, was sure. somewhat dominant. Based on our farmers, you know, and we didn't have any way to predict the the weather, weather prediction, but with the monsoon, right? That kind of. So, so we wanted, and at that time, the supercomputer definition was what was available from a company called Cray, Cray, which comes from Samuel Cray, I think, who was considered the father of supercomputers. So based out of US, I believe. Yeah. It was based out of U.S. Of course, and it was denied. No, it was not denied was because we wanted to buy it. But the U.S. The Department of Commerce said that this cannot be exported to any other country without their explicit permission, which was not given. Sure. So, so we didn't have. So then, uh, at that time, it was Rajiv Gandhi had gone to the to U.S. for a high technology accord with. The then president of the United States, uh, Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan was more generous man, so was known to be more generous man. And um, when Rajiv Gandhi discussed this issue that this is so critical for India's agrarian or agricultural economy uh, for monsoon prediction, uh, so it should be allowed. It should be allowed to be exported to India uh, sure. for our for weather prediction. So we are not using it for any military or any other project, any other purpose. But reluctantly, Ronald Reagan agreed with the, the, the Department of Commerce, but they agreed to give us a, an obsolete supercomputer, which they had. Okay. Which okay. They, in a, obsolete in the sense that it was already super passed by uh, other models uh, with the conditions that it will not be used for anything else other than with the tradition. Okay. Under six supervision. And he said that, and at that time, the, the Secretary of State at that time said to Rajiv Gandhi, very arrogantly, she was a lady, uh, she said that if it is used for any other purpose than agriculture for, for weather prediction, then we will see to it that not even a pin is exported to India. So that sure. was the, that, and he felt very humiliated and rather insulted. And when he came back to India, he said that why a supercomputer cannot be developed in our country, that like, like we have done with Mohammed Baba, uh, for atomic reactor first, and we did for all our satellites. We started sending our uh, with, for, for our space program. We started launching rockets and satellites uh, under the leadership of who was that? Uh, I'll just be saying, uh, the rocket boys. Of course, we, we have. You know, you have that. So that uh, why can't we develop our own supercomputer? Uh, so. That's how the Rajiv Gandhi challenge, and he organized a conference of scientists, and I was one of them because I used to work on in the, field, in the Ministry of Electronics under the leadership of Mr. K. P. P. Nambiar, and he asked, "Why can't we develop it?" So um, I told my secretary that we can, we can develop it, and he told very boldly that we can also develop our own supercomputer. Sure. So there was a meeting. Here. There was a meeting between Rajiv Gandhi. Mr. K. R. Narayan, who was the uh, uh, then Minister of Science and Technology, and myself, I was called. I was called because Mr. Nabir identified me. Uh, so, uh, Sarabhai. Dr. Sarabhai, who was the Secretary of Space Program, who was ISRO, Chairman of yes. ISRO. Yes, you remember that. Uh, so I was called for that meeting, and uh, he said, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi asked me, can we develop this supercomputer? And I had told him um, boldly that I have not seen a supercomputer. Of course, I have seen a supercomputer in general, a photograph, hmm? a picture of a supercomputer, what is the gray, uh, gray machine. But I, I have not seen it. I have not worked with a supercomputer. I have not touched a supercomputer. I, I have not seen a supercomputer. But I feel from intuitively, and based on what we are doing and what we are uh, thinking we are, we are trying to do, 
in the field of electronics at that time, and the new architecture that has come, that was, I felt that yes, we can develop it. I've done that attitude, strong feeling, inner feeling, and with confidence, self confidence, yes, we can develop it. Second question he asked me is that how much time that would take to develop? I said that we have we have been struggling with the US for the last three years to get one supercomputer from the US to import one supercomputer from the US. But if we give the freedom, we can do it ourselves. Not only the supercomputer, but we can develop the whole technology and whole laboratory huh? that can develop future supercomputers. So he was very pleased with that answer. And he said, how much money, how much, what funds you would require? I said, at the cost of one supercomputer, there is a uh, the clay machine which we are trying to import, uh, it will cost about 35 crores, that is 7.5 crores. So I this is my initial calculation show that and that that kind of funds we can develop the entire technology. So then he said uh, he was very pleased, he, he smiled, and he said that the, then this mission is approved. And that's how the, we, we began on this development. Uh, and proposal uh, a proposal laboratory to be created. Okay. Laboratory to be created. Uh, which we call CDAC, Center for Development of Advanced Computing, uh, which had proposed that we we'll start from Pune in the, in the Pune University campus. And that's how the project began. That is a, that is a short the, the brief history of <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and we developed, we developed it uh, in that time, in less than that, uh, three, three years. The entire technology, the lab, whole laboratory, a team of 100 people, and that's all it was done. Is it true that uh, when we developed uh, the supercomputer, no other country believed that we have developed it? No, no, not only no other country. We ourselves don't believe. <laughs> we didn't believe ourselves that we had developed the supercomputer uh, because it looked like some uh, clay machine looked a particular way it was packaged. So people sure. thought that is a supercomputer. So where, where, what we were demonstrating was the product, prototype in some frames, you know, in the, uh, we're not, we're not, we're not showing the, the final machine, we're building, building the prototype machine, we're showing the whole, the electronics within the, uh, that, that, uh, those cabinets, which were built. So people did not believe. And of course, um, Russia was trying, Germany was trying at that time, uh, the whole Europe, uh, uh, the joint project between uh, England and France, they were trying. So most countries, did not believe that we have a supercomputer until we took it to European exhibition or uh, conference, major conference called CONPAR, Con Conference on Parallel Computing, Con CONPAR 1990. That's it. So it was, <laughs> yes. It was a huge leap, I'm sure. Yeah, it was, it was indeed a leap. How did we achieve that leap? By, by a new techno, by an innovative technology, an innovative idea. What is called massively parallel supercomputer, uh, parallel, massively super parallel architecture for building computers. That is combining thousands of small computers, thousands of small computers together, connecting them in an innovative manner and writing a software layer on that, by which a single problem is you have thousands of problems and they are solved together. And the final answer is given. What was your vision behind uh, the supercomputer Param 8000? The vision was in Tali, so we had a national mission that India must have a supercomputer and specifically to solve all its, its problems of uh, monsoon prediction. That was the vision in the sense that was the mission. Rather than we, it was a mission that India must develop this capability. And the mission was to develop this and making it available for Indian farmers uh, weather prediction calculations. Okay. Can you tell us more about the high performance Param Siddhi AI, which is the fastest supercomputer developed in India so far? So far, we have been developing a series of models. I told the government that is it's not just one, you develop one supercomputer. Sure. And we have developed it. The technology is advancing so fast, and computing technology is always advanced that far that this capability will double every 18 months or two years at the same cost. So we have to develop, keep developing this race, uh, formula race. Uh, you have to keep on developing more and more and more and more powerful fast supercomputers. So we have been developing that. And we have been calling, we have called this model as Param, uh, the whole what system we do. Param meant supreme and su supreme is super. So that's why we, the Sanskrit name was Param. And we had, we had named it. Now, the, over the years, uh, there was a, another advancement that is uh, supercomputers that can be used for artificial intelligence. So Param AI, uh, so 
So current recent model which we had developed was called Param Siddhi. Param Siddhi model, artificial intelligence that is installed in the, they are installed in different places in India. Okay. In all, most of the IITs have weather predictions and most, many of the most laboratories have space program has the, the Param systems with them. The current model is called Param Siddhi AI because it runs AI, artificial intelligence software. Yes. Uh, Siddhi was the name given. Mm -hmm. so this machine. So you have seen it all. So where does India stand in terms of artificial intelligence today? First, I will say where, where does India stand in supercomputing or high performance computing? Uh, India stands, uh, one st simple statement would be that whatever supercomputing like computers which you want today, we can build ourselves. That is the sure. thing. Now these machines are built um, with different capability and there is some sort of always a race. I feel that we should not, we, that race is not important for us alone because it takes a lot of money, it costs a lot of money and it, uh, technology gets obsolete within no time. No? So we should build system on demand, whatever the system we require, we'll build that time. Uh, uh, so that it doesn't get obsolete. So we build a large machine. So I think that we should not run uh, that race on this system. We are not for running the race, we are here to solve the problem. So we are building such systems. So India has that capability today. How is itself starting from the uh, chip level? This system, from standard chips levels, we can build the systems. Although we don't have foundry, we don't have foundry for building the chips. And that is correct because to build a uh, foundry uh, today, we require four billion dollars to build that foundry, which India cannot cannot afford at this moment. Again, the technology gets obsolete in no time. So we started building these, these components from uh, uh, building the getting the standard chips and building the systems. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, so you are the brain behind the GIST multilingual uh, technology. So, what was the stimulus for such an invention? What is what was the you were the brain behind the GIST multilingual technology. Yeah, the, see, the GIST multilingual technology, I started feeling at that time that while we, while we are talking, while the technology is being developed, India is a multilingual country. We speak sure. many languages. Yes. Many languages. But there was no computer technology behind our, our computers. Means, like what, are, what is today, like for the, for what you use for the DTP, or you use for printing or technology or newspapers or uh, creating the books. In multilingual technology. So, if you don't have multilingual technology, uh, see, India is a multilingual, multi language, multilingual country. Now, at that time, about 18 languages we use and 10, 10 different scripts. Today, we have 22 languages and 10 different scripts to be written. So, that technology was very important. And that's how we started another mission, another mission like project. You know, it was not approved mission in that sense. That can okay. no budget point. So what I propose to the government will save from the supercomputing some project, some money, and use it for uh, build, developing multilingual technology. Uh, so this idea was, I think, uh, uh, was a man behind who who said that this can be done and how it can be done, and uh, was a member of my team called Mohan Tambe, who had come from IIT Kanpur, Kanpur, uh, IIT Kanpur, and so I think. He was the person who, who showed that uh, grit and confidence that we had, and we built this very quickly a team uh, for developing this multilingual technology. From Sidax Param team only. So. Okay. So, sir, uh, talking about IIT, so according to you, how can we create more IITs and, uh, you know, information uh, technology hubs in the country, according to you? According to what would you say? According to you, how can we create more IITs and information technology hubs in the country? I think we are creating, uh, earlier only we had five IITs, you know, first five, I'm one of the, one of the products of that yes. IIT Delhi. Yes. So, so. so today we have 23 IITs all over the country. So we have done that actually. Today we have almost every I, IIT in every state, every state of India, almost like that, kind of except for small states. So that's what we have to do now. I think and we don't require more than that. Those. We require very high quality, we require to fund them more, we require uh, high quality people, uh, students to be admitted. Well, IITs are known by the students, 
and the quality of the students and of course the infrastructure and the teacher but the quality of students which come to iit which compete to get admission that we are enough iit is now we are icers why icers now so we are like iit like iit is but it's sometimes better than iit is how can one take mkcl computer literacy program further the mkcl idea started again doing the super computing machine itself so okay. then i had a problem that kind of thing that uh, the, the, i was surprised i was shocked not shocked uh, i was pained rather then when you saw that we are building the the hubs for software export you know we are building some uh, software technology parks in india the people who were working on that uh, could not read or write uh, so yes. india has very low literacy high illiteracy and low, low literacy rate so we decided that we should build uh, india we should build uh, literacy first literacy comes first then building computers and uh, and not only there is this no we are starting we should now lead prop not just literacy we should build computer literacy program and that was called mkcl maharashtra knowledge corporation thing yes. it was it was a independent initiative which was which wanted to be which was, which was large with the government of maharashtra maharashtra help but not not the government of maharashtra so that's how kcl had a one mission to create highest literacy computer literacy program in the world so that's how mkcl was started by under the leadership of mr vivek saman who was who was one of the key players in cdac creation of supercomputers what was the idea behind forming cdac cdac was a for the supercomputer cdac was to build indian capability indigenous capability in supercomputing that was the main idea of building cdac okay like we build isro indian space research organization uh, for building space program yes rockets and satellites similarly we build cdac for building supercomputers please tell us about unnat bharat abhiyan unnat bharat uh, uh, abhiyan is a new initiative uh, which uh, uh, when i became the chairman of iid delhi okay so we said that i i reminded myself when i sat on the chair of uh, chairman of iid delhi i felt that i mean, india has a skill in major problems of uh, the uh about this uh, uh, economy about this agriculture sure and but india 6.4 lakh villages i come from myself a small village of population that that time 500 population and i said that uh, why not we link our our uh, villages to to our colleges well, because the colleges are emerging and uh, there, there are so many colleges emerging why not connect a college to a village and let them uh, village be a laboratory of a college something like that. so we can develop those villages and that's what that was that program was called unnat bharat abhiyan to develop india's large number of villages what kind of resurrection work have you undertaken for the university of nalanda we're talking about the resurrection of nalanda yes resurrection of nalanda yes nalanda university so i was chosen to be the chancellor of nalanda university as you know the nalanda university was a madam one of the one of the leading universities of the first universities of the world one of the first universities takshashila was the first thousand year later we had the idea we built nalanda university uh, in the town of nalanda at that time which was at that time the most advanced university of the world okay uh, so, but this university uh, so there were so many attacks on this university the last attack was by by bakhtia uh, some from babar's one of the sardars who was there and there is a story about it why thing like that and and uh, for some right for some reason which, which it was a large story to tell but it was burned down by him that he said that india has such a knowledge that they can build it, things like this and they can um, build a, a full library system we can cure cure fewer uncurable diseases which himself was cured by that like that using that he said it is then this thing was simply burned down that was the islamic culture of burning the libraries or destroying the buildings and that kind of things okay and now uh, chosen for that building so where is it now yes we have built we have rebuilt that entire um, university now during the last 3 years uh, on a campus of 500 acres which is a large campus i think we have built that in the uh, university we have started offering now some initial courses in um, in uh, major disciplines which are humanities based discipline more sure. historical studies 
on in a say, sense religious studies, uh, historical studies on uh, uh, what we call sustainable development of its villages because Nalanda was built was supported by its farmers, find uh, find a farmers around it. So sustainable development. So uh, about seven disciplines we have started offering courses there. And okay. So the, the building it is uh, infrastructure. We are now trying to build that kind of culture, meditations and this one and uh, okay. the, the newer emerging field which can build future India. What is the purpose behind the establishment of Multiversity Private Limited in Pune? See, multiversity is my idea. Was my like, one of major ideas. Uh, multiversity is something like a university which is a very liberal university, which I wanted to create. Not a uh, thing like that. It should be able to offer the disciplines on demand or what are required for the future, sure. like artificial intelligence, like data sciences, like new new languages uh, of the computing data like science lang languages, which will create and all, also also for the the, the kind of disciplines which are offered at Nalanda at that time is the Nalanda image. So it, that's why I call it multiversity, multi okay. not not university. Mm -hmm. But the idea of multiverse had come in physics that there is not only one universe, universe, but there are many universes which are called multiverse. So that's why I call it multiversity, and we okay. created it. Private, I I created I divided this into two part of it, multi multiversity as a trust. As an NGO, as a trust, no, and multiversity as a company. Uh, new innovations can be created. New companies can be launched. So, multiversity, private limited, was a company. So, okay. a company, and multiversity is an is a university. Thank you so much for your time, sir. It was lovely talking to you. Very, very enlightening. Thank you so much for your time.